it's half past, so we'll, we might as well make a start. So thanks, thanks everyone for coming out. There's a few, quite a few new faces, so thanks for everyone who's who's not been before. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's a that's a great point. So you probably noticed for those who have been before, there's a bit of a slightly different different feel now to the evening, and that's because we've had we've had a, had a bit of a, a bit of a rebrand. We've freshened up. Um, we hope you like it. Any feedback would be would be appreciated as well. Um, so yeah, have a chat with one of us or drop us a message. Just let them know what you think. Uh, we, we really like it. We spent a long time in it, um, and we, we yeah. I was asked, why doesn't it get on two photographs? Jeff. No, Nick's there. I'm not. I'm not. Jeff. Wait, it's funny, Jeff. 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 Jeff
in order to address uh, some of the questions that uh, people uh, shared be before this before the session. Um, so it's not too many slides, but in a way, two things I'd like to do. Uh, the first one is create a, a shared understanding or make sure we, we have the same understanding of what, what that is. Um, put it a little bit into context and maybe talk briefly about some of the, the benefits that it can offer, some of the reasons why uh, I tend to find roadmaps helpful tools. And then share some tips uh, in order to apply product roadmaps effectively, particularly in an agile setting. So let me uh, quickly share my screen with you. Well, I hope it's going to be quick. No. <laughs> <laughs> the gremlin is. Oh, I'll try again. Can you see a slide deck that says Agile Product Roadmaps? Yes. yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. Um, and if you've got any questions, please, at any point in time, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I can't see you, unfortunately, while I'm presenting, but whenever I hear uh, somebody uh, say something, I'll uh, move back to my Google Hangouts window and then I'll uh, hopefully can see you again. Um, and I'll stop anyway uh, during the presentation. So, you know, there, there should be plenty of time for q and I don't really plan to talk much longer than about a half an hour or so. Um, but uh, again, you know, I'll stop in between. And if you, if there's anything that you don't quite understand, you disagree with, or if you'd like to share an experience from, uh, from your work, then please uh, do, do interrupt me if I don't mind at all. If you want to speak, I'll pass you the mic because my, um, the, the mic and the laptop won't, won't pick you up. So if you want to... To be honest, Tom, you'd need to change the setting on, on Google Hangouts to use that mic, so probably best to... Leave it, okay. Just, sh just shout then. Shout loudly. <laughs> cool. So what is a product roadmap? Um, uh, feel about this, but uh, it's getting autumn. Um, and uh, you know, today was a very rainy day, quite windy, at least here in Buckinghamshire, in southern Buckinghamshire. So wouldn't it be nice uh, if we now started thinking about a holiday Maybe uh, you've already started uh, thinking about one, uh, be it uh, a break away in the winter or a summer holiday, uh, maybe uh, with the family, and uh, going somewhere nice and warm, maybe a beach to relax and uh, you know, spend quality time with uh, the wife or the husband and the kids or just some friends. Um, now, if that's what we want to do, then for me, it, will fe it would feel natural to uh, do a little bit of, in a way, uh, research or upfront work, you could say a little bit of thinking and use a, a map, be it a paper map or more likely a, a mapping product, a digital mapping product these days, and figure out how I can get to this lovely beach. And let's assume that where we want to uh, go to is Angelin-sur-Mer, uh, somewhere in southern uh, France. In fact, uh, it's pretty close to the Spanish border, uh, pretty close to the mountains, and uh, I'm, I'm based in Buckinghamshire, as I mentioned, so in Wendover. And uh, the experience has told me that uh, at least when uh, there are three kids in the back of the car, it's not a good idea just uh, to jump into the car and drive off without uh, some consideration about route choices. And the first one really, for me, uh, for us as a family, comes uh, considering uh, which um, way we should uh, drive around London. Should we go eastbound or westbound around the M25? And then the next decision point will be, uh, should we take the shuttle across to France with a ferry? And then motorway choices. Now you can see uh, this is a, a, a screenshot from Google Maps. Um, so yesterday afternoon, Google Maps advised on driving via Paris. However, there are other options. We could drive via Lyon, for instance. And even if we drive via Paris, we don't necessarily have to drive, you know, close to Montpellier. We could also drive via Toulouse. So these, you know, it'd be probably worthwhile exploring those different route choices. And then you can see that the, the travel time here are over 14 hours. So fair, fair, fair amount of time you know, to spend together in, in the car. Maybe it's too long for a family road trip. Maybe I should break up the journey. Maybe I should think about booking a hotel. Um, but where could I book it? Maybe somewhere south of France. You know, so you know, it's a, these kind of um, questions they come come natural. I feel when we prepare a road trip. And uh, that's what a, a, a roadmap helps us with. It helps us uh, thinking through those questions and coming up with, with the answers that, that seem viable, at least at this point in time. Of course, things can change. Um, you know, there might be more road work, there might be more traffic jams, and I'm 
we may have to change uh, the route to that we've initially chosen, but at least with a with a, with a little bit of a road mapping up front, we've got a rough idea how we're going to get to our destination. And just uh, like with this uh, example, and in the case of a road trip, I would suggest that you consider doing something similar for your products that you. You create a, a roadmap uh, for your product that essentially describes the journey and the journey you want to take your product on. So what is a product roadmap? Well, uh, in my mind, it's simply an actionable plan, a plan for your product uh, that shows how the product is likely to evolve, how it's likely to grow, uh, typically over the next six to 12 months. Um, and uh, it usually covers several major releases or product versions, so it usually you know, has, just communicates which benefits the product should offer over an extended period of time. Again, I mentioned earlier six to 12 months, it might be a little bit longer, um, 18 months in some cases, if you have a product that has hardware, you may have to look ahead to 24 months, but it's uh, again, it's a, it's a longer time frame, uh, not just uh, a, a, a month or a single quarter, I would suggest. Oops. Yeah, that was it. That was really quite quick. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I had another uh, bullet point here on my slides. Shows you how well I know them. And and so in its in its simplest version, the product roadmap uh, is a a, a timeline <laughs> that has milestones showing along those uh, timelines, just like the decision points I was talking about earlier. So you know, eastwards, e, you know, eastbound, westbound, N25 uh, shuttle or ferry, and then Paris or Lyon, and and so forth. Yeah. Now, um, it might be helpful, as this was a gen quite general introduction and description of the product roadmap, um, to uh, put it in context and see um, what other planning artifacts might complement it. And uh, the, the first one that comes to mind uh, is the vision. And for me, the vision really is the uh, ultimate purpose of the product, the positive change it should bring about. So an example I like to use is um, if, if I was to develop a product that helps people become more aware of um, what they eat and maybe how much they eat, um, then the vision behind this product could be healthy eating. So this is all about uh, the purpose of the product. It's all about establishing or describing uh, the ultimate goal that we'd like to achieve. Um, and in terms of the horizon, uh, you know, the time frame covered by this uh, by this. Um, goal, you could say, but it's an inspirational goal, I'd say five years, maybe more. And um, I wouldn't necessarily expect that a product uh, fully meets or achieves a vision, but the vision should really be um, offer continued guidance and be something like the true north that provides fundament that provides alignment on a very fundamental level. Yeah. So that's that's the vision. Um, now, next, the next thing that uh, I like to think about is uh, what I would call a, a product strategy. And the product strategy really describes um, our, our chosen uh, approach, our, um, our way in order to achieve the vision and make the product a success. And it typically, you know, I typically say it should cover something like the value proposition, the main reason for the users and customers to engage with the product, um, the problem it should solve or the specific benefit it should offer. Um, you know, think about a, a mapping product like Google Maps or Apple Maps. Um, you know, helps you to get from A to B, or think about a, a product like, say, Twitter or Facebook, allows you to connect with family and friends. The former is maybe more a problem-solving product, the latter is maybe more a benefit-generating product. Um, it, you probably also want to describe the audience, the, the customers and users. You may want to talk about standout features in your, in your product strategy, and uh, you may want to talk about specific business benefits, um, be it generating revenue directly or indirectly by marketing, sorry, by marketing, helping market and sell another product or service, or uh, reducing costs, or developing the brand, or whatever it might be. Yeah? And so in terms of the, the planning periods, uh, here with the product strategy, I would suggest product lifecycle stage. So that'd be something like introduction, or growth, or maturity, and that's typically well, hard to say, but I'd say typically longer than six, six to twelve months. Often it's uh, 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 you know years rather than several months. Uh, you know, one and a half years, two years, uh, maybe longer that uh, a life cycle stage covers. And then connected to the product strategy is the product roadmap. At least that's the way I like to play it. That's the model I like. I've suggested and I like to to use. And in that sense, the product roadmap is an actionable plan, as suggested earlier. 
and describes the journey of your product. Um, and uh, the uh, period uh, covered is uh, around 12 months. So I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, about six to 12 months, uh, at least for a digital product. <coughs> and with this setup, your, your strategy describes the overall approach, again, to achieving product success and uh, reaching your, your vision, uh, making progress towards your vision. And the product roadmap then it details your, your product strategy, says how will the strategy be, be executed. Yeah, so in, in going back to the example I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, summer holiday, uh, one strategy is to drive to southern France. Another strategy would be to fly or take the train, maybe more environmentally friendly. We could be more ambitious and maybe a cycle or even uh, take a longer, longer break, a sabbatical and walk down to southern France. So, you know, those will be different strategies and before I start creating, a, uh, consulting a, a roadmap and uh, booking a ferry or the shuttle or uh, booking a hotel, I think it's, it's worthwhile making sure that I've chosen the right strategy, that the road trip indeed is, is the right choice. You know, so uh, vision, a strategy and then comes the roadmap. Uh, that's at least the way I like to, to play it. And then from the roadmap, you can derive the product backlog, and the product backlog again contains more details, so you can see that those plans become uh, progressively more detailed. And also the uh, the horizon covers, the planning horizon gets shorter and shorter, from five years now down to two to six months. Um, again, that's simply my uh, personal recommendation. Uh, the, the product backlog, you know, can look forward to the next ten years if you if you if you want. Sorry, but. Uh, I found that it's beneficial, generally speaking, to work with a concise uh, product backlog, uh, and that means it's it's a good idea to um, consider limiting the period covered. Yeah. So that's the model I like to use, and uh, that's basically the model I I, I also apply uh, in the in the in the following slides. Very much. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, please. So. Are there any questions? So the. You, you use the metaphor of, of driving down to down to France. And if we if we look at that in terms of the kind of products that we're more likely to build on a day to day basis, the, the the driving part or the ferry part or the the rail part that that feels like a how a how part. So how would you? Uh, so normally we'd be thinking about the how is in you know technically how we're gonna how we're gonna deliver the vision or the strategy. How how would you kind of? Put that in the context of a normal product roadmap as we are more familiar with. What would a strategy be in, in, that, in that context? I'm not sure I, I sort of uh, <coughs> fully understand the question, to be honest. So I, maybe it helps, um, or, or it doesn't. If it doesn't, then please do let me know if I uh, try again and explain what I mean by a product strategy. So the product strategy for me contains four key elements. The first one is the value proposition. Now, why would anybody want to use or um, in any form pay for this product? Second one is who are the customers and users who should benefit from this product? Okay, so you know why would anybody want to use it? Who are the people who should use it? And then the third element will be what makes that product special or stand out or different? Why would anybody choose it over a competing offering? Certainly very helpful for a commercial revenue generating product. Why is Google Maps different from Apple Maps? Or what makes Apple Maps stand out from Google Maps? Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the fourth element is what, what are the expected and desired business benefits? Why would it make sense for the company to invest in developing and providing the product? So in terms of uh, questions that are being answered by a strategy, it's twice why, user goals and business goals, and then the who, who are the users and who are the customers, users and customers are different. And then there's one what question around the standout features and that helps you then to differentiate and position your product. Yeah. And I find that helpful to, to figure that out and to test that out and make sure that the general approach, the general strategy you've chosen in order to move your product forward and make it a success, <coughs> uh, independent of where your product is in its life cycle, independent of if it's a brand new product or if it's a a product that's an introduction or a product that's in, 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 in growth. Uh, whenever you think about, okay, what's next? What should we do next? Or how, how should we progress our product, change our product in order to make it or keep it successful? It's good to look at those four questions. And then the roadmap essentially takes the product strategy 
and refines it. It simply says, okay, now over the next 12 months, what are some major milestones? What are some major benefits? Now some more tangible, some more detailed benefits that we want to offer. And I'll talk a little bit more about how I do this and you know how I connect the product roadmap to the product strategy um, in, in more detail. Did that help a little bit? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry for getting on the house there. That's answer my question. Cool. I mean, the other thing I should maybe say that the, the roadmaps I'm talking about here are, are primarily internal roadmaps. And um, I mean, the various, I mean, the, you know, people distinguish external and internal roadmaps. External roadmaps are often then shown to customers. To a certain extent, they, they act as a, as a sales tool or to instill confidence um, in people that uh, the company is committed to the product and has some great ideas in the pipeline. Great things are going to happen with this product, hopefully. Um, and then, you know, there are obviously other roadmaps, the technology roadmaps, the visionary roadmaps that you know, talk about the development of uh, entire industries and, and markets. But I'll just purely focus on product roadmaps in this talk. Yeah. Cool. Um, a few benefits, um, and you may be aware of some of them anyway, so I'll try and cover them quite quickly. Um, provides a continu continuity of purpose. I guess that's true for any planning tool, but I feel particularly in an agile context, if you only look at the next sprint, or if you only look at the, the upcoming months or even the next quarter, it can feel a little bit short-sighted. And so with a roadmap in, in place that covers the next, say, six or 12 months, six or 12 months, you, you have a, a, an improved continuity of purpose. You can see, you can more see, you understand better how things might unfold. Um, facilitate stakeholder collaboration. So for me, the product roadmap is, is great to uh, work with the stakeholders and align the stakeholders, and I find it much better suited than the product backlog. Uh, product backlog is often too volatile in my experience and too deep for the stakeholders to be really useful for. So uh, I think, again, in terms of uh, um, pulling in the stakeholders, engaging them, creating shared understanding and alignment, the, the roadmap is, is, can be great. Helps with prioritization in terms of not only saying are we going to do it or not going to do it, but if we can't do it now, then maybe there's an opportunity to do it in three months, six months, nine months time. Um, unburdens the product backlog. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, I'd like to connect the product backlog to the product roadmap, and I'll say more about this uh, in a few slay, in a, in, 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 a, in, a, in a short while. But it, it can help you to work with a more a focused, a more concise product backlog. And it can help acquire a budget if you are in a position that you have to persuade management to fund your product and give you money so you can uh, progress your product uh, in the next, uh, say, financial year. Yeah. Um, and uh, finally, it supports portfolio management. So whenever you work on a product that's part of a group of related offerings, uh, you're looking here uh, at um, um, uh, a presentation tool, uh, a specific presentation tool, <laughs> Microsoft PowerPoint, <laughs> part of a Microsoft uh, Office Suite, uh, a great example for a uh, portfolio with uh, uh, other core members being uh, Word and Excel, I guess, and of course, you know, the, the, the further ones like uh, what Outlook and Visio and whatnot. Um, so that will be a portfolio. Whenever you have a portfolio, whenever your product is part of a portfolio, then roadmaps can help you uh, anticipate and manage dependencies um, between those uh, those products and, uh, again, uh, create a form of uh, alignment. Yeah. So um, while uh, roadmaps, you, you know, can have drawbacks if they're not used uh, appropriately, uh, I do find that their benefits uh, justify that we at least consider using them. Yeah. Cool. So far, good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Cool. Then uh, let me move on and uh, talk about uh, a few product roadmapping tips. Um, and my first uh, recommendation would be to focus on goals, on uh, desired shared outcomes or, or benefits, and not primarily on features. So I, I'm very much uh, in favor of working with the goal-oriented roadmaps. Some people call them themed or theme-based roadmaps. Uh, others have spoken about benefits-based roadmaps or outcome-based roadmaps. <coughs> um, so the, the focus when we create a strategic product plan should not be primarily what needs to happen, but I think we should carefully um, ask why we should progress the product and why we should progress the product in a certain way. So let me introduce a specific roadmap template to you. Uh, it's just, just one example. 
Um, and uh, this template is called the Go, the, the Go Roadmap. Uh, Go stands for Goal Oriented Roadmap. And uh, as it is a goal oriented roadmap, the goal is central to it. Uh, and again, uh, that's the uh, benefits the product should offer the desired outcome. <coughs> uh, for instance, to acquire users, or it, to, it could be to um, extend, uh, increase the user community, it could be to start monetizing the product and uh, generating revenue, it could be to reduce costs, it could be to um, increase retention, um, it could be to future-proof the product by reducing technical debt. So those would all be sample goals. And as I mentioned earlier, the way I like to create roadmaps is connect them to the uh, strategy. In fact, I like to derive them from the strategy. So for me, strategy comes first, a product strategy comes first, and then a product roadmap is derived from it. And the, the goal or the goals on a product roadmap uh, should be systematically connected and derived from the goals in your strategy and that means from the user customer goals and from the business goals so any goal here on your product roadmap should essentially help you meet the goals stated in your product strategy again i'll try and say a few more words about this a little bit later yeah. so goal is for me the central element here um, and then uh, metrics, I like to use uh, metrics on uh, my product roadmaps as I feel that having visionary goals is great, but you know that's then the realm of the vision. Here, when we talk about product roadmaps, we want, uh, we want a smart uh, plan and we want smart goals. We want measurable and specific goals. Mm -hmm. So it often makes sense. I find generally it makes sense to consider what are the measurements, what are the criteria to help me determine if a goal has been met or not. So, you know, if we talk about an acquisition goal, how many more users do we want to acquire and who should those users be from the same segment or from a different segment, from the same region or a different region? And how soon after uh, a new product version or a release uh, has been made available do we expect to meet that benefit? A few days, a few weeks? Uh, can we quantify that? Can we make that more specific? Um, so again, something I'd encourage you to do um, to make sure that your goals are specific, that you, uh, can measure them um, and uh, that you consider how you're going to measure goal attainment as part of your product roadmapping effort. Uh, next are features. So I still personally, I still find it uh, useful to uh, put features on a product roadmap. However, <laughs> I'd like to say that those features should be course grades, that <coughs> like capabilities, think about things like registration or reporting or search and navigation or then, uh, uh, online retailers website for instance you know, so think about jenlewis.com, tesco's.com, amazon.com you know, it's like search and navigation and there's like um, what, uh, product details and you know the checkout steps uh, those would be major features in my mind so I uh, put only big features on there deliverables uh, three to five uh, as a rule of thumb and um, and derive them from the, the goal so the, the goal comes first uh, here in this context with this type of roadmap and then once you've established the goal you derive the features so if you now created a brand new roadmap using this template i would encourage you to first think about the goals you you, you want to achieve with your product over the coming 12 months based on your product strategy and once you've established those goals and it feels like yeah that's a meaningful story that's kind of a a consistent journey or that's kind of a logical journey for our product then think about the features which also means that some if somebody comes to you with an idea for a new feature or a feature request uh, then uh, the first thing would be to see oh is there a goal on our product why not <coughs> the feature would fit that the feature would support and if there isn't such a such a goal well then you'd have to think if it's worthwhile um, introducing a goal or changing an existing goal and carry out an appropriate cost-benefit analysis. Maybe. <laughs> um, that's, uh, uh, that's sort of uh, the penultimate uh, section here at the top. Uh, well, uh, uh, as the name suggests, uh, allows you to state a design release date or time frame. And again, uh, for an internal product roadmap that uh, is aimed at aligning the stakeholders and development teams, I like to work with dates. Um, if you have, if you use an external roadmap, you may want to keep the timeframes very coarse grain and say like, um, you know, now or next year or in the distant future, or in, you know, in in the second half of 2019 and the first half of 2019. You know, you'd still be using timeframes, but again, that'd be very coarse grain, very rough. 
But if I'm internal roadmap, I find often balancing date and goal uh, is very important. So it's very important to look at the date and think about dates. Uh, think about either um, by when can we reach the individual goals, or if you have any deadlines, if you have any specific target dates, is uh, meeting a goal, fully meeting a goal at this date, uh, likely to be realistic? And if not, what are the consequences? So, and some products are uh, seasonal products, think about uh, smartphone devices, or generally the uh, products in, within the entertainment market. Um, or I was uh, doing some uh, work in the healthcare industry a few years back, and uh, at least for uh, certain uh, healthcare products, there's a big trade show in the US, the RSNA. And uh, it tends to be the case that when you want to uh, introduce a new product to the market, that you should show at least a, a preliminary version at this trade show. So again, you know that be a, a true deadline that you have to meet. And for that purpose, uh, again, it could be it could be very useful uh, for you to consider um, making dates explicit. And then, if you do work with uh, major releases or product versions that really make a significant difference to the user where you maybe batch up functionality uh, over say uh, two or three months then uh, you know, this the final section is there so you can give your um your releases some cool names hello man again a very very simple uh template hello man can i ask a question about, about dates do you have hmm. any do you have any advice on um how to derive dates and how to communicate dates. Do you give ranges? Do you give, how, how do you kind of come to a conclusion about them? And what kind of, do you put sure. any caveats around them? Yeah, yeah. So as, I, as I've mentioned often, um, finding the right balance between uh, dates and goals is, uh, is, is important in order to have an, an actionable uh, product plan, an actionable product roadmap. And sometimes the dates come first, as in the case of um, seasonal products or uh, when you have like this trade show that I mentioned, where you have to have an early product version ready. So sometimes the dates come first, and you know, for established products, some companies like to work with a, um, you know, what what is referred to, uh, particularly in the safe framework, as a as a release, a steady release train. Uh, I think I've, I've I've called it a steady release cadence in the past, where you have a bi-monthly or quarterly releases, and you say we want to stick to those. Uh, to those fixed releases, to a fixed release schedule, as it instills confidence in the users and customers. They know they'll be getting something of decent quality. Um, you know, to which extent we then can then reach the goal, and how many features, um, and to which extent we can implement those features. That may vary, but at least the dates are fixed. So that's one approach. The other approach is to say, that doesn't work for us. We really need to meet our goals. Then you'd first establish the goals, and then together with the development team, you, you make um, informed assumptions and estimates around what, what dates are realistic. You know? yeah. And sometimes it's a bit of both that you say like, oh, you know, we want to acquire more, us more users if we really like to sort of get it done this quarter. And then it's a question of, okay, if we want to have a, a new release at the end of the quarter, and then at the end of this quarter that will uh, attract more, uh, more users, then um, um, how ambitious can we be? And to which extent can we can we can we meet that goal? How many more users can we actually attract? And uh, you know, again, from which market or market segment will those users come? Yeah. So it's really about a conversation primarily with the development team, and to a certain extent also with uh, the stakeholders, the business stakeholders. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, yeah, it does. So are you, are you saying that the date, the date, you, you can fix the date, but what what would be negotiable with the the feature set? That goes into that. The goal, the goal, the goal primarily. Yeah. So you can happily, in my mind, you can happily fix the dates. You can happily go for <laughs> by month quarterly releases, and again, you know, have that steady cadence, have that release train. Uh, I don't think there's any personally. I don't think there's any problem with it. I mean, it may not be appropriate for your business, but generally, it's something you know that is open to you as an option. But then you have to be flexible on the goals, and with the goals on the features. But, but you know, if you want to use this type of roadmap, which I find is particularly conducive when you face <coughs> uncertainty and change, or when you're in an agile environment, when you work with agile practices, then you should first and foremost then focus on the goals and not the features. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be then date first. If it's date driven, or if you have fixed dates, then you figure out you know, within those dates or timeframes, what goals can you achieve? And then based on the dates and goals, what features, what deliverables, what capabilities do you have to provide? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Cool. Any, any other questions about this specific uh, type of roadmap for this format? Yeah, Roman, do you think, do you think this approach complements, uh, would be complemented by OKRs? Yeah, nice question. Thank you. I mean, any question is a nice question. A good question, by the way. That was not meant to be judgmental, but uh, I think it's an interesting <laughs> question. And it's not the question I'm asking here. Yeah, yeah so... Um, So the, uh, I'll, I'll try just try and order my thoughts to, to give you a, a not, not 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 go off on a tangent and not give a, a very long <laughs> long winded answer and test everybody's patience even more. Um, so you know the way I encountered OKRs, uh, admittedly uh, quite a quite a quite a while back. Uh, sorry, Roman. Firstly, uh, what is an OKR? Sorry. I was going to say, firstly, what's an OKR? Oh, objectives and key results. Oh. So the idea of objectives and key results is really to establish typically cascading, uh, tangible, measurable goals for various uh, business units, various groups, and various teams. And the way I've encountered this um, at Intel was that it was part of management by objectives. That means you had top-level company goals, and it was systematically <coughs> broken down into group goals, business unit goals, and then team goals. And then personal goals. So your personal goals, your personal objectives should ultimately, ultimately uh, roll up to the company-wide initiatives and the company-wide objectives. Okay, and the key results would then describe how you know that you've met that goal or the deliverables that have to be put in place so you can consider the goal as being met. Now, what this roadmap format does here is it also focuses on goals and you can look at the, the features as in a way key deliverables, key results that have to be provided and the metrics as the criteria for you know, double checking that the goal has been met. You know. And so in my mind it fits quite nicely into an OKR approach and I generally find working with goals very useful. Um, but th there's one just one thing I'd like to say and that is um, you know, I, I, I know from my own experience that I can get very um, attached to goals and I can then, um, you know, really feel like I must achieve and, you know, that goal must be met um, no matter what, in all circumstances. And that's just something I think is worthwhile uh, bring, bringing awareness to. Um, you know, using goals I think is very useful, but I think we should be goal-led, not goal-driven. And so sometimes goals just turn out to be unrealistic uh, for whatever reason. Maybe we were overly ambitious, uh, maybe we've overestimated our own capabilities or the, the capabilities of the development team. Uh, maybe it's a combination thereof, maybe unforeseen things happen and bad luck happen, people falling ill or, you know, we, we fall ill. So um, it's just important, and I'll try and talk about this later a little bit more than to, uh, on a regular basis, revisit our plans and revisit our goals and be willing to, to change them. And if necessary, be willing to let go. Yeah, so don't, don't cling to goals. You know, have goals, but don't cling to them. <laughs> That's my advice. <laughs> any, any other questions about about this, this this format? Are you all sort of scared that I'm giving you now? No, so no just sort of you know, this advice. Just one, actually. So when you say that, does that mean we shouldn't? Well, businesses generally shouldn't incentivize against goals as well, because otherwise that creates the behaviors that you were saying we shouldn't be doing. Because that's what OKRs <coughs> quite often are, is a, is a way of providing reward and carrot and stick and all that for achieving them or not achieving them. Which means people do then get married to the yeah, goals. And, it's a very good question. I don't think I've got a, I've got a, a good answer for, for, for your question. Um, I, one of the reasons that I like to work with a vision is because I feel the vision is a, is, a, is a good way, at least for me personally, to judge if working on a product is the right thing. So I find if the vision, if the ultimate purpose of the product doesn't resonate with me, then uh, at least that's what experience has, 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 has you know, what, what experience tells me, then I, I should try not to, to work on this product. So I, 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 you know, so if there's not an intrinsic motivation, if there's not kind of, kind of a natural, um, inclination towards that vision, then for me, it's it's better not, not to not to work on, on that product. Um, and so, from from that perspective, ideally, you know, if you work with methods like self-selecting teams, the the people who who are engaged with the product, the, the people who work at least with the development team, should should have an intrinsic motivation to um, 
to progress the product and do good work. Um, you know, particularly then if you know you also work with a, a self-organizing team and you know try and empower people to to take responsibility and own the solution or at least as much of the solution the product as possible and you know the, the de allow people to make detailed product decisions. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a really good one. I, I just you know the, I was I was talking in a way less from an organizational perspective but more from a personal. But I think that there are these both dimensions. There's the personal dimension. How much do we kind of attach ourselves and our self worth uh, to achieving certain goals, both at work and in our private life? And then how what do we do with incentives? And um, yeah, yeah. And again, for the for the latter. I don't, I think I've got a good eye. Oh. Thank you. Okay, should I continue? Yeah. Oh, by the way, we had a, we had a question here. One of the questions submitted was, was uh, for creating and maintaining a product roadmap. What's the best tool for the job? So I, uh, I'm, I'm slightly biased. Uh, I'm very biased probably because that's a, a format that I've suggested. So I didn't come up with goal-oriented roadmaps, by the way. I, I do not know who's invented uh, that specific approach. It's been around for a number of years. But I just, you know, put that little template together, which really isn't a big deal. But if you do like it, you can download it from my, my website and you can consider using it for your road mapping uh, efforts and in order to capture your, your, your road map. Uh, the next slide talks about the relationship of the product road map and the product backlog. Um, so here's our uh, product road map. Uh, it's a, a strategic plan um, that describes how the product is likely to evolve, to grow um, over the next six to 12 months. And uh, here is a uh, product backlog. And for me, the product backlog is more a tactical tool. A tactical plan contains the product details, things like ethics and user stories, which, by the way, uh, in my mind, should only be in the product backlog, not in the product roadmap. Um, so it's much more detailed than the product roadmap, and it may also be more, more focused, more um, may, may be, maybe shorter in terms of the period covered, maybe only one or, or two releases. And, uh, the way I like to do it is that I like to establish the roadmap first and then use uh, the, the goal of the upcoming, the upcoming goal, the next goal on the product roadmap together with the, the key features or deliverables in order to decide um, how to stock the product backlog, how to um, update it and then how to refine it. So I essentially try and limit or focus the product backlog on the, on the next product roadmap goal. So that means that the, the, the period covered by the product backlog is maybe the next two to three months. And again, that results in a very concise, very compact product backlog, which is easier to update, easier to maintain, easier to prioritize. It just reduces your, your, your product grooming, your product uh, backlog ref refinement on overhead. However, if that's the way how you set, set it up, and, and you know, I find product roadmap and product backlog complement each other very nicely, I would say, though, that you really do keep them separate. So as indicated earlier, a user stories and ethics should only be on the product backlog, not on a product roadmap. Otherwise, you're in danger of um, getting an overlap between those planning artifacts, and then, you know, it becomes more difficult to keep them in sync. But that's something uh, you know uh, you'll have to do whenever you complement a product backlog with a product roadmap. We'll have to make sure that any, any bigger changes in the product backlog are taken into account and reflected in the product roadmap, if and when appropriate. Yeah. So just just to keep just keep them in sync. Yeah. Um, but as I, as mentioned earlier, that way you unburden the product backlog, and you know, as explained now, you can focus the product backlog on the, the upcoming product roadmap goal in the next two to three months, and so you just have less stuff in your product backlog, less less work. Um, maintaining it less work, updating it less work, attending to all the product backlog items. Does that make sense? Is anybody working that way? Or is that something you're quite familiar anyway? Can I just say, Raymond, that uh, <clears throat> where I am at the moment, we are missing the product backlog. So we've got the uh, strategy, we've got the, uh, the vision, and we have about a year and a half's worth of work in the product backlog. So uh, I appreciate what you're saying, and I, I am feeling that pain right now. So grooming cool. it and planning from it is damn near impossible. Cool, good. Well, you know, so it might be then an opportunity for you for you to, to change that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
And, uh, and actually, I'm just looking at the, the sheet with the questions. There was another question around uh, replatforming. I don't know if uh, the uh, person who's, who's kindly submitted the question or suggested or you know, shared it is in the audience, but it was about replatforming an existing product and it's easy to slip into a mindset that everything has to be developed before anything can be released. And so I feel that a product roadmap actually can, can help you with this. So if you, know, if you first of all, take some time out to do some analysis around who really uses the existing product. Is it one homogeneous product or is it maybe morphed into a collection of product variants? Uh, I think that will be very useful. What are the main user journeys? Is everybody using all the functionality and features or you know, do separate uh, groups use separate parts of the product? Are all the features really valuable to the majority of the users or did some just make it into the system because a powerful uh, stakeholder uh, once requested it but it was never much use? So I do some initial analysis and some user research at first and then uh, maybe do some product road mapping where you uh, lay out how you expect the product to grow and uh, where you can at least then have some uh, preliminary or some internal releases or releases to test users. So you reduce the risk of uh, going for a big bang release 18 months down the line, uh, only to discover possibly that uh, a lot of things don't work as expected and there are a lot of issues and a lot of defects and um, a lot of panic. Yeah. So I, I, I then help create transparency, it might help um, create understanding and, and alignment with the, the, the sponsor and the, the stakeholders. So that, that's actually a question that I, um, I've been having in the back of my mind as you've been talking, Roman, is that it doesn't seem to be, um, so I'm, I'm imagining that if you're doing some kind of a lean startup or lean UX approach to product management, that you can't use any of this. Is that right? I'm not seeing any feedback or um, sort of emergent, um, emergence coming out of this roadmap. It seems to be a uh, sort of look ahead and, and plot and plan rather than um, do a series of experiments and have the roadmap emerge as you go. Am, am I missing something? Uh, yes, uh, you're not seeing it because it's not on the slides, because it, that wasn't really sort of kind of, so thank you very much for the comment, it's uh, very well observed, it's a, it's a great observa observation. So I, um, I should have maybe said this needs to be, can you, I hope you can read my horrible handwriting, this needs to be a validated product strategy. In fact, I think I've got this here, that's the next one. So I'm doing the necessary uh, uh, prep work and having a validated product strategy. What I mean by validated product strategy is very much as uh, suggested in uh, Lean Startup that you uh, look at your initial product strategy as a collection of assumptions and, uh, identify, and identify that then the, the major hypotheses. Or if you, uh, like me, quite like to talk about risks, um, then identify the major risks and then think about what you need to do in order to address them. So there could be a risk around that the value proposition might not be strong enough or that, that maybe not enough people might have uh, a specific problem you know, um, that you want to solve. And so it might be very uh, useful to do some direct user observation or uh, do some uh, interviews, some problem interviews. So, I, uh, sorry, it's not writing, I'll try again, go away. So the, the validation uh, loop will be here. Yeah. So in my mind, there's no point in creating a product roadmap when you don't have a validated, sufficiently de-risked product strategy. So if you're not sure, or if you're not confident that you've nailed the uh, value proposition, that you've chosen the right uh, market, market segment, the right target group, that your product has uh, standout features that will differentiate it sufficiently and that the business goals are tangible and, and realistic and you know there is a way to monetize the product there is an underlying um, uh, viable business model then i don't think there's any point in creating that product roadmap that would be just like me not being sure um, how best uh, how best to travel to southern france <coughs> fly make the train or drive and I'm already booking the shuttle, I'm already booking a hotel, I'm already worrying about, oh my God, should we drive via Lyon or Paris? Oh, what is the right option? What should we do? No point, no point. I mean, first I need to figure out what is the right strategy to get to our holiday destination. Then I can do the road mapping. Did that help a little bit? 
Yeah, so you're in the middle of this journey with, along your product roadmap, and then um, Thomas <coughs> Cook goes out of business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happens. So, so, so all of a sudden, your roadmap is, is invalidated, right? So I'm, I'm a recovering PMO, so um, I'm. Uh, I see. Yeah, so at this level, it, 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 at the organization at the executive budgeting level, it gets kind of awkward when you're having to go back and say, well, yeah, we had this three year roadmap, but um, guess what? We're not doing any of it. So I think, yes, no, I can, I can understand. So I think that the two things to first, first of all, again, you know, I would suggest before you create a product roadmap, you know, be, be confident that you've chosen the right strategy. And, you know, in order to be confident that your strategy is, is likely to be effective and will likely uh, translate into a, into, into a successful outcome, spend enough time to validate your strategy. You know, you know, that is then part of what some people refer to as product discovery. So spend enough time in product discovery, validate your strategy, carry out market and user research, do some technology research and some prototyping, look into your business model, depending on how innovative your product is, depending on how much uncertainty there is, depending on where your product is in its life, life cycle. Uh, you know, that's typically not only true for brand new products, that's why it's particularly uh, helpful. But it's also true when you're going for a product lifecycle extension, when you have a successful product that's uh, maturing, where the, the value of the product creates is starting to flatten off and you now want to, say, move it to a new market. And you may also need to go through a major strategy overhaul and some discovery. So that's something really to consider and something to practice and something to make time for and something to plan in. Um, and then the second element is, despite our best efforts and despite all the, the, the validation and the research work that you may have done, things do change, right? And so it's important to keep our roadmap, our plan up to date and regularly review it. Um, and that's just as important as the planning part. Uh, and so, you know, this little matrix wants to give some guidance uh, how often it should be uh, reviewed looking at product maturity and how uh, dynamic the market is that's just my those are just my recommendations i'd say if you have a young product in a market that's fairly regularly changing then maybe you need to review it monthly uh, otherwise a good rule of thumb will be quarterly and if there's lots of stability it might get away with uh, six month reviews but if you're not not not, not sure review your product roadmap every three months and review it together with your product strategy. And you look at things like um, product performance. Uh, you look at things like uh, trends in the marketplace, consumer trends, regulatory trends, technology trends. Uh, you look at what the competition is doing. You look at what's happening within your company. Are there any bigger changes within your company, for instance, around business strategy? Um, and then you look at uh, any significant user feedback. You look at uh, the, the progress made by the development team. Um, and uh, once you factor all these, all these, uh, uh, all the data in, you should be in a good position to see is your roadmap still valid? And is your strategy still valid? You know, is everything on track or do you need to make any changes? Yeah. So a roadmap is a living, living artifact, just like the strategy is a living artifact. Yeah. Okay, and there are two more things that I wanted to, well, it's actually, it's more, more one, but it's, I've sort of split it across uh, two, two pages. Um, and that is, what, what, I, what I'd like to suggest is a, a, a collaborative approach when it comes to product road mapping. Yeah. So a uh, roadmap with the players, it means here, and I've, I've mentioned stakeholders a few times, you may have come across this little a stakeholder analysis tool it's called the power interest grid and it suggests that you essentially categorize your stakeholders according to their interest and to their power and then you get four groups uh, you know crowds subjects uh, context setters and players and the people who uh, i feel you should uh, involve in product road mapping um, uh, activities in creating an initial product roadmap but then also uh, reviewing and updating um, an existing roadmap are the players, and those are typically people um, who uh, you, whose, whose help you require, whose input you require in order to provide the product. So that's first of all the development team, but then it's people for, for, for commercial revenue generating product from uh, marketing and sales, 
uh, maybe uh, service or support, uh, maybe operations, uh, maybe legal, maybe finance. So, you know, that's something in a way, an analysis that you have to do for yourself. If you're not quite sure if you are my key stakeholders, my players, then this little tool can help you. But then I, I, I feel it's very much uh, helpful to run collaborative workshops rather than you trying to create the best possible plan on your own and then you go from player to player and say, do you agree? You know, do you've got any other, do you've got any objections? Do you consent? Do you've got any other ideas? And then sort of try and, uh, and, and find a comprom compromise or mediate between, uh, between people. So again, my, my preferred way is you know, very much like what we're used to in an agile setting, bringing people together. Um, and yes, it can be, can be challenging. You know, some of those individuals may be senior. And uh, one danger is that the hippo wins, the highest person pays, uh, the highest person, highest paid person's opinion. <laughs> too, too many Ps. Highest paid person's opinion wins. Um, or that some people just check out and don't engage, don't participate, maybe even feel intimidated. Uh, and so it can be very helpful to have an experienced scrum master or otherwise facilitator present who uh, lays uh, down some ground rules and makes sure that people um, participate uh, uh, in, in the right way, in a, in a constructive way. You know? so, um, but again, the, the, the big benefit is that you then leverage the knowledge of, of everyone present. People hear each other's perspectives and ideas and concerns. And, um, and, uh, and by attentively listening to the individuals, uh, the, the buy-in, the support that you're likely to get it will be much stronger. So, you know, if, you, if you truly listen to people, uh, then, then usually people will, will support you even if you can't take on board their idea or their request if you're able to explain to them why that is and if they, if they, if they feel understood, again, if, if, if they feel that you truly listen to them. Yeah. So uh, my suggestion is again to involve lots of people here, as, as is shown here, in the road mapping effort. Um, but then ultimately the person in charge, the product owner in an agile setting should own the product roadmap and that means if people can't agree, if you can't find say, you know, content and you've tried it and you've discussed for a while, then you know, I'd say well maybe the product owner should have the, the final say and make a decision so you can move on and the scrum master is there to, to facilitate and uh, yeah, make sure that people uh, engage and participate in a constructive way. Roman, do you make a yeah. distinction between the product owner and the product manager? Sorry, the question was what's the difference? Do you make a distinction? So I guess the product manager is not on this slide, so are you, are you using the product owner as standing? Uh, so, you know, a product, product manager is in a way a more, more traditional title, you could say. So, you know, product managers have been around for longer than product owners. Um, so, product owner is a is a is a is a role that, that was uh, that originally emerged in Scrum. So, in the, in the Scrum framework, that is, and, um, and in that sense, I'm, I'm using the role here. And okay. I've hopefully uh, okay. I've always looked at the product owner as an agile product manager. Okay. So, I've always thought the product owner is a product manager role, but in an agile setting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but I mean, I'd also like to say that uh, more recently, uh, frameworks like Safe uh, have re tried to redefine the product owner role. So the Safe product owner is not the product owner role shown here. A Safe product owner is a, you, you, some of you may disagree with me, but my understanding is somebody who looks after the, the product details and takes care of the product backlog and works with the development team. So in a way, the Safe product owner is more like a product backlog manager, user story writer, yeah. Uh, rather than somebody who engages actively in and leads leads strategic uh, products product work and, and, and you know ensures that the right strategic product decisions are being made, whereas you know the Scrum product owner so that, that's the product owner role I, I I've intended here uh, the Scrum product owner should do that the Scrum product owner should aim in my mind to empower her or his team. So that the team can largely own the solution and work in a in a in a in a ideally self-sufficient way, um, and then ensure that you know the, the the product owner spends enough time with the stakeholders, but also users and customers, and attends enough to discovery and generally strategic work. Thank you. Well, 
at least, you know. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be an idea. <laughs> One idea, or some people might say. Uh, I think that, that was it in terms of the presentation. Uh, oops, uh, uh, the rest is just, uh, you know, the usual plug. Here's another great book, buy it, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, yeah, anyway, I think I'm sure you've have heard this before. So those are the slides I've got, um, which actually has taken me uh, quite a bit longer than expected to <coughs> take you through. And I haven't really checked in on how things are looking if, you're, if you've fallen asleep or not. Uh, most of you still look vaguely awake. Um, so I don't know how much more energy you have um, if you want to go on any longer or if you're dying now for a break and a pizza, and that's perfectly okay uh, too. Um, I'd like to go on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, there is one left. There is one left. Yes. 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 Anyone got any more got any questions or anything then for Roman's point? Yeah. I was going to say, what does a product roadmap really look like? I mean, so you go through this process of creating it. Um, uh, what kind of granularity do you put stuff on that roadmap? I think so. It's a bunch of feature level. You mentioned goals. So it's below those. So what kind of size do you describe things at? Have you not done it? Uh, yeah. I, I used it if it helps for my very first Scrum project I ran, yeah. it's a Scrum Master RT learning, um, and I downloaded it from Roman's um, website, and it worked really well for me um, because I really didn't know where to start. We had an agile coach in, right. and she recommended Roman. She she's got a thing for you, Roman. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, it it. It helped focus our minds. Um, it, it was a very small project. Uh, it was doing a business intelligence um, dashboard for a public health team in a county council. Um, and they couldn't, they didn't know what they wanted. So I created their vision and aligned their goals using that template. And it was really good because I allowed, I, I broke it down into uh, three small releases from the product roadmap um, and we, we just had um, you know uh, three months of sprints you know each month we had a, a release and each release um, satisfied the goal and we measured it and we were able to move through it really quickly and it, it, it worked really well for me. One, one thing, Roman, we're currently looking at a picture of ourselves on the screen. Can yes. you stick, stick your webcam yes. back on? Yes. So that's the only way I can see, unfortunately. Oh, right. So, yes, I, would think, I, I just quickly went to my blog and opened up one of the blog posts uh, that I wrote a little while back on, uh, on product road mapping. And, and so, you know, there's one sample roadmap, that's just a, a made up roadmap. So, maybe something for you to uh, look at and go through uh, when you have a, a little bit of time. The specific sample roadmap here is also linked to a sample uh, uh, product strategy uh, using uh, uh, another template I've created called the product vision board. So, you know, maybe maybe that, that could be a good um, article for you to, to look at. Um, it's called uh, Working with the Guide Product Roadmap. A few, a few articles um, and uh, a few examples, made up examples of product roadmaps. But you can see just very briefly in terms of the level of granularity, it's pretty high level. You know, I mean, there's some goals on there and they may benefit from uh, refining. Uh, the metrics certainly will, will have to be reworked as well. But then when you look at the features, they're very coarse grained and intentionally so, <coughs> because I feel you don't want to limit the team, the development team's creativity up front but really want to allow them to inspect and adapt through the, the sprint process and through um, you know appropriate solution validation techniques, be it a product demo, be it an early release, be it a usability test, a combination thereof, and decide um, what functionality is really needed. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, maybe maybe something to, to look at. That that was one that I looked at and was able to successfully deliver something from that. Yeah. I'm happy to shield them from my gift. Too. Are there any, any other questions about product roadmaps? Yeah, just wide it. Roadmap out now. Have you? Uh, I was interested in. Um, I don't know your name. Is well, this gentleman was saying about like an emergent um, product, and then you did kind of touch on it, saying that you might want to do it more frequently. But have you ever been in a um, trying to? 
product own something that is changing so fast and is so emergent that actually it doesn't make sense. You end up just managing the change all the time from what you thought you were going to do, so it doesn't make sense to do a roadmap at all? Yes, absolutely. So I think, I mean, first of all, again, if you haven't got a validated product strategy um, in place, then you know, don't start roadmapping. Secondly, if you can't look further than the next three months or so, Again, I, I personally wouldn't bother with a product roadmap. I think you've got to be able to confidently look ahead at least for the next six months. But don't, for, don't forget that looking ahead means that you take the, the user, customer, and the business goals in the, the strategy, and you then refine them and make them more specific in the roadmap. So that, that's what's needed. And then the second thing that's needed is to get a feel for, 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 for in a way, the timings, um, you know, when roughly do you believe you can offer those those benefits and, and meet those goals? And then uh, maybe a little bit about some key deliverables that are needed in order to to meet those goals. Yeah. But again, if you can't do that, don't don't create a product roadmap. Right <coughs> um, yes, don't, don't don't look any further than you than you can realistically. Okay, great. If you haven't. Any more for any more? Cool. Um, there are two more questions that I haven't answered that people have submitted. One is about product owner and analyst. And the other question is about helping an organization um, define what a product is. Um, are the individuals who've asked those questions in the room? Yeah, I, uh, <coughs> I asked the owner, owner analyst one about the potential um, tension between those two roles. Okay. Yes, cool. Um, so. I'm just looking for an easy way to, I'm being a little bit lazy right now, I could have just drawn it up. Uh, I've got something here that I can share with you. So, um, again, that's that's from my blog. Um, so the, the, the two good ways I found in my work in order to deal with business analysts in an agile scrum based setting the first option is shown here, uh, that the business analyst essentially uh, develops into a product owner. But uh, as, as the, I, I try to indicate with the choice of words, it is a, typically a, a development and depending on how the business analyst role is, is, is practiced, is played in a specific organization, it may feel like quite a natural step and it may, you know, I know I, I've known business analysts who essentially did the work of product owner stroke managers, um, but I've also known business analysts who were quite technical in their work and to a certain extent worked as system analysts. And so in that case then it's a bigger transition. Uh, the best best, best, best approach is really to, to do a, a skills gap analysis, so what will be the desired skills as a product owner, which skills do I currently have, what do I need to do in order to then become an effective product owner. You know? The, the alternative uh, uh, option that I found works quite well is when the uh, business analyst becomes a team member. But again, then the, um, the the nature of the work encountered by the business analyst will change. As a team member, the business analyst will be expected to um, sign up to other tasks apart from, uh, say, uh, defining and refining uh, uh, requirements, uh, user stories in the product backlog, but maybe help out with testing um, and uh, documentation and, 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 and other tasks. Uh, I mean, as you as you will know, the development team is collectively responsible for for, for meeting the sprint goal. So you know, the product business analyst, like the other team members, is required to um, uh, be a team player and yeah, and, uh, and, and you know, just just help out really. <laughs> um, did that help a little bit? Yeah, it does, yeah. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, cool. Again, uh, in case you're interested, it's, it's on my blog, maybe something then to uh, to follow up if you if you would like to. Um, and then the question around uh, product, is, is, was, the, was this, this the individual in the room or is that? That may have been mine. Could you remind me which one it was, Emma, please? Um, that was uh, the question around what is the best approach in helping an organisation new to the concept of product management, define what a product is. Yeah, no, that, that wasn't mine. I should have been anything else. 
Okay. I actually want. Yeah. I would like to ask a question, which is not. Yeah. Yes, uh, please. Is is uh, the product owner? Is he the team manager, or is just a product owner? Say that again. Sorry, it's the product. Is a product owner. Is it a team manager or, <laughs> or just a product owner? Again, let me show you this. It doesn't look like I'm just sort of uh, I'm just being very lazy and ripping off uh, my my blog. But um, before I start, <coughs> before I start drawing, this might be faster. Might 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 not. So I've got the, the image I wanted to show you is here. So I, uh, 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 about a year ago or so, I, I wrote about um, uh, product, product leadership in, in Scrum. But, but to a certain extent, what the article is about is really uh, trying to bring some, some clarity or establish some clarity around the intention of the product owner role. And so as you can see here, what I've suggested is that the product owner should be responsible for vision, strategy, roadmap, product backlog prioritization, and uh, engaging the stakeholders. And the development team should very much be self-sufficient and empowered in the sense that they take on UX design or all the development, make all the development decisions and self-organize. And then we have the Scrum Master who provides process and people a leadership um, that helps with process um, and, and uh, choosing specific methods, helps with collaboration and organizational change and development. And then there's some shared responsibilities between product owner and team user research, sprint goal selection and uh, product backlog refinement. Um, so in, in my mind, it's more an anti-pattern when the product owner is like a team manager. The, the team, the development team shouldn't have a manager, it should be a self-organizing team and the product owner should in a way um, do everything she or he can to uh, help help build an empowered self-sufficient team um, so i often find that product people think they their job is to um, uh, write detailed requirements and feed development teams with detailed requirements and that is not true in my mind i think that's a misunderstanding you know, often development teams, particularly initially when you start working with a new development team, they need a lot of support, they need a lot of help in, in a way, hand, hand, hold, hand holding, if you want. So if that's not a derogative, it's certainly not meant to be that way. They need a lot of support. So, you know, if a team is, is new to the product, if a team is new to the market or domain, they often know little about the users and the user needs. Um, they may not really understand the context in which the product is, is embedded and used and so forth. And so then as the product owner, you end up explaining a lot to the development team and there's a natural desire for the development team members uh, for, for detailed, small requirements or user stories. So that's then what you tend to do is you tend to break the, the, the requirements, the user stories down as, as much as you can. But in, in an agile scrum based context, you should always try to do that together with the development team members, do it collaboratively. And secondly, you should not be kind of this should not become a permanent uh, solution you know this should should be only the beginning of a kind of relationship and, and you should then try and, and mentor and coach the development team members in the sense that you you you, you ensure that knowledge is transferred and you encourage the individuals to you know think on their own and, and make decisions and slowly take all ownership of the details of the product I mean, ideally for me, the, the product owner owns vision and strategy. Um, and the development team owns the solution, the product details. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that way the development team can be, can be, can be, can be creative um, and, um, yeah, and take ownership and the product owner has enough time for, for discovery and strategy. I mean, if you continue to uh, spoon feed your development team with detailed user stories, you know, sprint after sprint after sprint after sprint, then yes, it's it's very hard to make time for discovery and, and, and strategizing work. But I mean, that's the, the important work that needs to happen. It may not be as urgent, but it's important. That was a long answer, sorry. Uh, thanks. I, mean, so I just wanted to know because I, I've seen some you been behaving like a CTI, they're the employer of labor. 
So was that enough for you for tonight? Is there any more? Any more questions? Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Roman. So, so that was, uh, was a pleasure to be with you. I hope it was a little bit useful. Yeah. And um, if you have any follow-up questions, don't be shy. Just uh, contact me via, uh, via email or via my website um, or tweet me or whatever, whatever works for you. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much for thanks, thanks for giving it your evening. Thank you and enjoy the pizza. Enjoy it on South France. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Roman has left the building. So, yes, yeah, so there, there is pizza outside in a second. You, you want to see that arrive. Um, we were just one. So, we usually do give a book away. So, this is a book that we've, as I said, we've got, got to give away this evening. We're thinking of a, an innovative way to give it away. So what we thought we'd do is, anyone who asked a question, do you want to come up to the front? Uh, here we go. If you if you want to ask a question, if you want if you want to if you want to win the book, if you want to throw in the middle. That's even better. So what we thought we would do is how many how many people there are. Anyone want to win the book? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, that's a question. Yeah. That's a question. Yeah. It's a shy one, so just three. Just three? Three? No, it was four. So, so you don't have to do anything. anything. You don't have to do anything if you've got the point. You have to do it then, but we're just going to eat. We're going to stay up here and take disappointment. That's all we're going to do. Very graciously. I thought we'd just spin a wheel, and whichever number comes out. It's going to be a bottle, isn't it? Oh, no. So we're going to come and do a camera simulation game called Change Band. We're trying to get that set up at Barclay Card in Northampton. So they've got a big, big room that we can use, use for that because it's going to be a workshop. So I'll just make sure you've got a contact there because I've asked and I think, oh, it might be difficult. I have got a contact, but he left. So <laughs> right. instead, it's very kindly trying to put me in touch with somebody else. Yeah. All right. Yeah, um, well, that's my direction, should we? Yes. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, Mike, I was speaking to Mike Lewis, but Mike Lewis is, is, is now gone. Okay. So uh, I, got, I, got, I was trying to get to Andy, but he's not getting much better than me at the moment. So. Yeah, he, didn't, he didn't respond to my email when I heard about my email, so yeah, yeah I'll chase it. So if, if you want mine. So it, the room's booked, because Mike, Mike booked it for me. So it, it should all be in hand, but I just want a bit of, a bit of clarity. So that should, that should be going ahead in um, November. In December, we're going to do lightning talks. So there's a few people that sign up for lightning talks. Um, so lightning talks, for those who don't know, they're basically just a um, short, very short talks that, that, that anybody can anybody can do. So they want a topic that you're interested in, or it might be a, a conference you've been to, you want to play back, or some experience you had in the office, or just something of general, <laughs> general interest. 
So it's a really good way. I mean, I, I found it a really good way just to get into confidence speaking. If, you, if you're interested, if you're interested in getting confidence, confidence speaking, it's a good stepping stone for that. It's good for improving confidence. It's good for just general, general improving your communication within your teams. So it's a it's a great opportunity. Safe environment. It should be a safe environment anyway. Um, so if you are interested, either come and see one of us this evening, or drop into a meet up, or get in touch with us at the next event. Uh, there are a few slots free, so um, please, please do come and see us about that. Um, we haven't got anything January yet. You'll notice that we haven't got anything in February. That is intentional. So from the last survey we did, where we asked about what frequency people thought was thought was best, worked best. We've now gone to a, we're going to go next year into a six week cycle. So that's, that's why there's in the February, because we're going to do it, so we'll, there'll, there'll be a, we'll, we'll skip a month every now and again. Um, so that's why that is. So we've got, we have got Mark sorted out, so we've got um, John Woolen coming to speak to us about cumulative flow diagrams. We don't want to offend you for that yet, but again, watch this space. Um, yep, yeah, so that's just a little bit about lightning talks. And yep. Yeah, Finally, just, just before we go for Peter, thank you. Thank you for everyone for coming out. It's really good to see you. Thanks for, especially to everyone that's new that's, that's come. It's great to see some new faces. If you've got some value out of it, tweet about it, LinkedIn about it, tell all your mates about it, friends and family. Um, and hopefully, hopefully we can get, get even more people coming down. So, big, big thanks for everybody. <laughs> And thank you, Tom, for hosting tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. There is pizza outside, there's drinks outside. Help yourselves.